Metro. We are in this series called The Seven Deadly Sins, and we've been talking about this idea that there are these vices, these habits, these certain sins that, that hold on to us, and they, they seem to dig their claws deep into our souls, and they do not let go easily. Uh, sins like anger and pride and laziness can absolutely consume us. They can destroy us, and either we need to kill them or they will kill us us. But today we're going to talk about one of the deadliest sins of them all, a deadly sin that is so real and so destructive and so dangerous that if you are not careful, it will wreck you. And it doesn't seem to matter who you are, whether you're a man or a woman, young or old, white or black, rich or poor, it is the battle of the highest importance. And I have seen the greatest of men fall because of this. I have seen amazing women who have literally traded themselves in because because of this sin. I've seen families utterly destroyed because of this one deadly sin, and it is called the sin of lust. Now, I want you to hear this. Uh, nothing and nobody in culture will tell you this, but I believe that nothing will take you further faster from the heart of God than sexual immorality. Uh, listen to me, friends. Let me say this again. Nothing will take you further faster from the heart of God, but not only from the heart of God, but from who you really want to be in this world and what you want out of life. Unbridled lust, unhinged temptation is an incredibly destructive force in our life. I heard a pastor named Mark Clark out of Canada say it like this. As a matter of fact, I wanna take a second to thank Mark for his writing and preaching on this subject because much of what I wanna share with you today actually comes from his thinking. I heard him preach on this topic of lust and it was so challenging and so encouraging and I hope to be able to convey some of his ideas to you today. Uh, but this is what he said about this deadly sin called lust. He says it's a psychological force producing an unbridled sexual desire, a longing for a person, a circumstance, or for fulfilling an emotion within you. He says it's an immoral desire for an object or for an action that governs and overtakes a person's intellect rather than the intellect and will governing the appetite for that object. I think that's incredible. Uh, then he says it like this. He says, uh, this imbalance can transform one into a slave of the devil. He says, if we don't figure out how to get our mind to rule over our emotions, we will become a slave of the enemy of God. Um, so can we just say something here? Uh, this is something that I've been saying for a long, long, long time. Uh, feelings are real, but they are not reliable. Feelings are fleeting. Feelings are deceitful. And you can end up doing really, really dumb things when you let your feelings lead you. I I've sat across uh, in my office from literally countless couples over the years, uh, and, and they are often so full of shame and full of regret and full of embarrassment. Uh, usually it's because someone has cheated. Someone has done something or embraced a feeling, and now they literally are looking at a family being torn apart. Literally what, what starts off as this beautiful dream, a, a relationship built on trust and hope and mutual desire is destroyed because of uncontrolled feelings. So let me say it again. Nothing takes you further, faster from the heart of God than sexual immorality. And, and always, listen, and always that starts with the secret sin of lust. Almost always, it's the same story. Uh, it starts small and then it grows and grows and grows and it becomes real and people can't stop following their feeling. The, the fantasy becomes real for them. Uh, thoughts become actions. And in fantasy life, the sexual desires or the thoughts toward others is just, it's called lust. And, it, and it, it, it's a, a deadly sin that if we're not careful, it will destroy you because it carries some of the biggest consequences in all of life. But this sin of lust, this sexual sin, it seems to define so many of our lives and so much of our culture. And every once in a while, I hear someone say, uh, this idea of lust doesn't affect my life or you don't struggle with it. And if that's true, if you don't struggle with lust, you're either dead or you're lying or you're like my wife, Lynette, who happens to be married to me. And thus, if you're married to somebody like me, you don't have a struggle with lust because you got everything that you want in life. That's just all there is to it. Ha, I'm just kidding, okay? But that's the point, isn't it? That lust is a desire for more. Lust is a desire for what you don't have or can't have 
or shouldn't have. Uh, lust is a strong passion of longing, especially for sexual desire. Uh, when we objectify another person for our own pleasure, that's lust. Uh, and, it, and it was the same way in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, right, with Adam and Eve, right? Uh, they, they looked at this tree that they weren't supposed to have, uh, that they weren't supposed to touch. And the text says that it was pleasing to their eye. Uh, and, and this is the thing about, about lust. Lust is pleasing to the eye. It's something that we want to satisfy. Uh, it has an aesthetic appeal to it, an aesthetic power over them. Adam and Eve became captured by beauty. Uh, and who hasn't become captured by beauty? I think all of us have. Uh, and, and they fell because they were captured by beauty. They, they fell when they became overwhelmed by beauty. They, they fell when, when something was beautiful, but it became twisted and perverted. When uh, they, they fell because they gave their minds over to the very thing that God said was out of bounds for them. He said of, of mankind, if you go back to the very beginning of, of scripture in the God-man relationship, he says, I want mankind to flourish. I want you to have pleasure. I want you to experience the good out of life that I have for you. Um, but the but, but there's one thing God says that's off limits. He says there are certain things that are out of bounds for us. And this is what lust is. It's when we don't think straight. Adam and Eve weren't thinking straight. And when we are captured, sometimes we don't think straight. This is lust. And lust can derail us. It can consume us. It can derail us from, from what's uh, good about our marriage. It can derail us from opportunities. It can derail us from a, a private spiritual life between you and God that is good and flourishing and alive. And, and friends, this is what lust does. It takes us away from the very heart of God. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking about weddings, right? When I do weddings, um, I, I like doing weddings, but like, I would love to just uh, do something crazy at a wedding one time. I, I would love to be like in the middle of the vows and just like put the brakes on, uh, you know, when they're looking at each other so affectionately and they're so in love and they're so excited about building this life together. Matter of fact, I just did another uh, wedding this past weekend and I would love to in the middle of it all just kind of say okay hold on for a second let's just put the brakes on this and look 15 years down the line uh, you know 15 years later when they got a couple of kids and they're not all dressed up nice and uh, they hadn't been working out and dieting all the time for the, like the last six months in order to get ready uh, for the big day of their life so they're not in the best of shape and um, you know they're feeling they're not feeling all the love vibes because you know the stress of life and the stress of work and uh, maybe they haven't had sex for a month or something and, and the pressures of life are mounting and the kids are driving them crazy. I, I would just, you know, l uh, love to get people to think about how bad things start to take over our life. Uh, see, here's what happens. 15 years later, he goes to the grocery store and there's a lady in aisle four and uh, she's kind of, uh, you know, cute. And uh, he like walks down an aisle and then cuts back and sees her again. And she kind of bats an eye at him and his, you know, something stirs inside of him, like, man, I still got it, you know? And, and, and something shifts, right? It's in that moment that you have to be careful how you feel because feelings are real, but they're not reliable. Feelings are real, but they don't often take you where you wanna go. And if you follow your feelings, it can wreck your life, right? Uh, so maybe it's just me uh, who's noticed that sexuality is the dominant landscape of our culture. Uh, pornography is everywhere. Sex and sexuality uh, is just reduced to an act. Uh, people are objects. Sex is cheap and it's on sale everywhere. And if we're not careful, all of that can consume you. All of that can convince you of a lie. It can mess you up. I remember when I was uh, back in college, I played in rock and roll bands and uh, uh, we were like uh, these Def Leppard wannabes, super long hair and the whole nine yards. And, and uh, one of the guys I played in the band with was a super good dude. Uh, you know, like we were just living large. He was such a good guy. And uh, we were doing life together so much of the time. And uh, he was a great guy. Matter of fact, we were in Bible college uh, together studying to be pastors. And I can remember distinctly about this guy that he had such a passion uh, for God and he had such a love for God and uh, he had a desire to uh, tell other people about the grace of God and to, you know, to really lead people uh, to that grace of God. And I remember uh, one day he comes over to my, uh, my home and my wife and I were there and he says something crazy to me. Uh, he, he says, hey, 
Jeremy, have you heard of this place called Deja Vu? Now, this is way back in the 80s, okay? And I'm like, deja vu? I, I know what deja vu is. It's when you think you see something again that you saw before and all that kind of stuff. And he's like, no, 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 it's, it's a new place in town. I'm like, what, is it a new dinner place? What, you want to go out to dinner? And he goes, no, dude, it's a strip club. And I'm thinking, why are you telling me this, right? And uh, he, he, he begins to to lay out a plan for me. He says, you know, I've been thinking about this new place called Deja Vu and I've been, you know, I know all these guys are going in there and it's, and it's so bad and it's so terrible for their families and it's gonna lead them right into the pit of hell. He goes, I want us to go there and to minister to these people. And I'm like, come again? He says, I said, well, you, you want me to go to a strip club as a young married man uh, just trying to do this right. I'm in Bible college. I'm studying to be a pastor. He goes, I go, you want me to go to a strip club to minister to people? And he thinks about it for a second. He goes, yeah, wouldn't it be awesome? Wouldn't that be like, wouldn't that be exactly where God wants me to go? Wouldn't that be exactly what God wants us to do to reach these people? And I'm thinking, dude, this is a bad idea. This is a really bad idea. And, and then he, and so we, we're kind of arguing about this. And he goes, all right, here's what we're going to do. You know, they got these black doors, a black door on the outside and a black door on the inside. We won't go in the doors. We'll just stay on the, we'll go, like, go to the parking lot and we will like stand in front of them before they get in and we'll share about Jesus. And I'm like, I'm thinking at that moment, these guys aren't thinking about Jesus and they're not even wanting to think about Jesus. And I'm thinking that some big dude called the bouncer is going to throw us off this property. And then he goes, well, I got a good idea then. Here's what we'll do. We'll go on the inside of the first door, but we won't go into the second door and we'll catch them right in between there. And I'm like, dude, you gotta be kidding me. This is crazy talk, right? Well, I obviously said, it's not gonna happen with me. Uh, it, 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 this is unwise, right? Because lust, because temptation uh, is too big. It, it's too strong. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this today, but, but What's interesting is how this story plays out. Uh, my friend, my dear friend, uh, who loved God and who was studying to be a pastor, he enacted his little plan. He, you know, he says he's standing in the parking lot, and then when it gets a little bit, you know, colder, he says he's standing between the doors, and then he tells me he's going on the inside uh, to minister to people. And it wasn't a matter of just a couple months before, um, before lust consumed him before lust took him completely out of the game. And, and the Bible uses this expression called shipwrecking your faith. Literally, he shipwrecked his faith. You know, the Bible says this in the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 12. Uh, it gives us this warning. It says, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it only leads to your death. Um, lust can consume you. Uh, and there's a reason why it has been labeled one of the seven deadly sins for a long, long time. And either we kill lust or lust will kill us. So let's talk about it. All right. You guys ready to talk? No, no, no. Are you ready to talk about it? Uh, I'm glad that you're joining us online. We have a lot to discuss today. Can I just say this again to you? Nothing takes you further, faster from the heart of God than sexual sin. Nothing. And I think you know this. I, I think you have probably lived long enough in this room uh, to realize uh, just what unbridled, unhinged lust, lust can do uh, in, in your soul. Um, you know, a lot of people think that lust is freedom, but lust is actually a form of a slavery. And I want to talk about this a little bit. Uh, there is this uh, Danish philosopher. His name is Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, he lived way back in the 1800s. He's dead now. Um, but dead people say some really smart things. And uh, this is what he wrote. He says, uh, there's a lot of people who view freedom wrongly. So he says, you can look at freedom. And there's a whole bunch of people who look at freedom in the wrong sort of a way. Uh, and if you think about this idea of lust, think about this culture of, uh, of lust that we live in today, where our culture says that uh, freedom means doing whatever you want with whoever you want, whenever you want, wherever you want. Don't tell me what to do sexually, right? Uh, freedom in our culture today uh, is that everybody should decide uh, whatever they want, whatever makes them feel good, whatever is okay to them is simply okay. Uh, but, but Kierkegaard, 
uh, said this. He says, there's a lot of people who view their freedom wrongly. And then he writes this. Listen to this. It's amazing. He says, when you define your life by how you feel in every moment, that's the ultimate slavery. Amen? Anybody? Uh, did, did you hear that? If you define your life by how you feel in any moment, if you run after how you feel in any moment, that's the ultimate form of slavery. Doing whatever just feels good in life isn't always good, right? Anybody ever just do something that felt good? Listen, I, I, I would love to eat chocolate all day, every day, and only chocolate every day, and never go to the gym. But what feels good isn't always good for you, am I right? Uh, listen, I would love to be able to spend all my money any way I want and just enjoy it in the moment and never have to save or uh, pinch or to invest for the future. Uh, but doing what feels good isn't always good. It's not always good, right? Uh, the truth is, and I think a whole bunch of us in this room are mature enough to realize this, that the truth of life is that sometimes you have to say no to your feelings. Sometimes you have to resist certain urges in life, right? Right? Because if you don't, it will mess you up every time. Because what feels good isn't always good. Let me, let me tell you something. You think about a marriage. If you want a great marriage, I mean, something that is worth having in life, right? If you want a marriage to thrive and to, to be alive, then there are going to be times that you just have to say no to your feelings. And you have to be committed to something bigger than yourself. Think about your relationship with God himself. Uh, there's very little in this world that wants to grow your soul. Am I right? Very little. And so sometimes you have to say no to those feelings that you have. Th this idea that you want to just chase whatever comes your way in life. And you have to be locked on to something bigger. You have to keep your eyes fixed on eternity. Right? If you want your relationship with God to work and to work. Well, we just can't live for the next four minutes of pleasure. Hello? And a whole bunch of us have lived for the next four minutes of pleasure. And how did that work out in your life? Usually not too well. It, it just doesn't end well, does it? Uh, but this is what lust does. This is what lust causes in our life. Uh, we, if we were to follow this never-ending appetite called lust, wherever it leads us, um, it, it, here's what would happen. For, for, think about a married person. There will always be somebody hotter. There will always be somebody sexier. There, there will always be somebody younger and who will make you feel uh, whatever you want to feel. There will always be that way. But listen, if we were to run after every single appetite, if we were to follow every instinct, every desire, every moment of feeling, right? Let me tell you something. It'll wreck you. Am I right? We will die because of it. If we were to follow our lust wherever it leads us, we will end up in slavery every single time. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody want to be real and just say, yeah, that's exactly what happens in life. Um, can, I, can I just read something from the pages of the Bible to you? Uh, so heavy and so important. Um, it's almost scary to read it. Uh, but, but can I just share what God has to say about this particular battle that goes on inside the heart of men and women about this issue? Um, in the book of Romans, chapter 8, in verse 13, uh, just one simple verse, and after you can never tell me that the Bible is not relevant because this is what it says about this battle that goes on in our soul. It says this, For if you live according to the flesh, those desires, those lusts, those impulses, those feelings, right? It says if you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you follow it, like, you know, double chocolate chip, brownie nut fudge with caramel and this man, glory to God, right? If you follow every impulse, every desire, you will die. You will die. Here's what it says. But if by the Spirit, but by the Spirit of God, if you put to death those misdeeds of the body, you will live. Um, so I think this is worth exploring because uh, this passage begins to paint this picture that freedom can be achieved, that there can be a different kind of freedom in, in your life. If, if you live according to the flesh, it says, if you follow every feeling, you're going to find out one day that your feelings were real, come on, but they were not really reliable. Anybody ever follow their feelings? Sometimes you better t think twice about following your feelings. 
right? And, and so the scripture's saying, if we were to follow those feelings, it will not end well for you every time. Uh, but if the spirit of God comes alive inside of you and it puts to death those kinds of lustful desires, those, those fleshly desires, um, you will actually live. And so I could just say it like this. I kind of wrote it like this. I think this is kind of good. I think it says, death comes when we give life to sin, but life comes when we put sin to death. Come on. Somebody needs to tweet that or something. Maybe that needs to go up on like your post or something, right? Because that's true. Because that's true. Death comes when we give life to every feeling that we have. But life comes when we figure out how to discipline that feeling. When we kind of learn how to rein that feeling in. Uh, John Owens, way back in the day, he wrote a book called The Mortification of Sin. And I mentioned this guy, I think it was in the first um, week of this series. Uh, But he wrote it like this. He says, you better be killing sin or sin will be killing you. You better be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Uh, Somehow, we need to learn to say no. Come on. We're adults in this room. Somehow, we need to learn to say no to those impulses that could potentially cause us great harm. Practically speaking, uh, sin, especially sexual sin, driven by this thing called lust, will, will come between you and God, and you know it. And you know it. But even more than that, not only will, will it become, come between you and God, but sexual sin driven by lust will come between you and every important relationship that you have. I guarantee it. It will destroy the closest meaningful relationships that you have. Let let me tell you something. If I'm honest, if we could see what is done in secret, um, I guarantee you that so many of the families that have been separated and broken is because of sexual sin driven by lust. So much of the fatherlessness that we see in our culture today is because of sexual sin driven by by lust. Am I right? Uh, so much of the poverty that we see in the world today is a direct result of this thing called lust. Desiring things that we should not have. Uh, uh, not being able to rein in those unhinged desires, right? Um, that don't help us, that don't further us, that actually hurt us in the end. I can tell you personally, from the countless families who have sat on my little couch in the office, how many of them if you could see what is done in secret, I'm telling you, um, so many of them are, are a direct result. They're hurt. They're, uh, the, they're, the abuse that they've suffered through, the uh, incredible disappointments that they've had, these, the separations of family, I'm telling you, it is directly a result of so much sexual sin driven by this thing called lust. It destroys people. It destroys people. It hurts people. Let me tell you something. Lust is not freedom. It is slavery. And everything in our culture wants to tell you the exact opposite. You're an adult. Do whatever you want. Nobody should tell you what to do. How dare they not not move? Lust is not freedom. It is slavery. And God's word has a lot to say about this. God's word wants to change this in our lives. Are you hearing me? Anybody want to say anything? Amen? Amen. God wants to change this. Um, And we can begin by reading the first six or seven chapters of the book of Proverbs just straight through, but we don't have time to read the first six or seven chapters of Proverbs straight through today. But some of you need to go home and read the first six or seven chapters of Proverbs straight through on your own because you'll see exactly what an unhinged life looks like. You'll see the destruction that it can bring. Uh, but God's word wants to change that in us. So, so could I just share a little bit about what God has to say about this topic? Can I? That's not very convincing. We can skip it. See you guys later. Okay, God bless. Uh, no, I'm serious. Uh, online, we need to talk about this. Listen to me. This is so critically important. Uh, I, I want to share what God's word has to say uh, from, about this topic of, of lust and, and desire and feelings, okay? Uh, so let me just hit you with some good stuff. The first thing we're going to read is 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, and it starts in verse, uh, just verse 11. It says this, uh, beloved, pause real quick, beloved. When's the last time you've been called beloved? 
right? Uh, this, this term that Peter uses is, uh, it's, it's unique among Christians. It's literally saying that we have this love connection that is utterly different than the rest of the world. It comes from our relationship with Jesus, right? You have this and I have this, and that connects us in a spiritual way, and he calls us beloved. So beloved, beloved. Now, I think he's trying to soften us up to something here, right? Because listen to what he says. He says, I beg you. I don't just ask you. I don't just kind of tell you about this. He says, I'm begging you to get something right here. I'm begging you to know this, to understand this, to live this out in your life because there's something big I'm gonna tell you. He goes, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. What is this idea of a pilgrim? Uh, it's this idea, like any Jesus people in the room, any Jesus people at all in the room? Anybody at all? A few of us? Okay, now listen, for those of us who are, are Christians in this room, you realize that this isn't home, Right? You do realize that this isn't it in life, that there's something that lives beyond the grave, amen? And so he's painting this picture that you're just a pilgrim here. You're kind of passing through and he's begging you to not get caught up in what's going on here. He's saying, I'm begging you that this world is gonna be so full of distractions that you're gonna miss the end goal. He says, don't do that. Now listen, he says, beloved, I beg you as pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lust which war against your soul. Would anybody care to admit that there's often a war against your soul? Anybody at all? You guys in the back never have this? Okay, because I, I think it's real for a whole bunch of us, right? Young people? You ever feel like you're just so torn? One of the reasons you're sitting here is because uh, you want more of God in your life. One of the reasons you're here uh, is because you want to fill your soul with what is good and honorable and noble before God. But then there's another part of you, if we're honest, right? that can just fall apart, that, uh, that is unbridled, that literally just takes in everything the world has to offer without even discerning it, without even filtering it, without uh, even thinking twice about it, right? And we're torn, we're at war. Anybody ever feel at war? I think so. Uh, li listen to what uh, this next passage is. This is 2 Timothy uh, 2.22. This is a little bonus, 2.2.2.2. Two, 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 two. Okay, you, you with me? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Listen to this. It says, run. Say run. run. You didn't help me very much. Okay, say run. run. There we go. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue. Say pursue. pursue. Pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. I don't think I have to uh, uh, come down and talk to anybody about what stimulates your youthful lust, right? We're kind of all on the same page, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, I don't think anybody needs to explain it to you. Uh, you know what takes you away from who you want to be. I think you know uh, what takes you away from who God wants you to be. And so he says, he says that there are these things that we take into our life that are going to cause us to become something other than we're supposed to become. And instead, he says, you need to, to, to pursue something different. You need to be purposeful with your life and go somewhere else with your life. Fill your heart with something different. Look at this next passage. Uh, this, is, this is hard to read. This is, this is tough. Uh, this ain't playing around. This is found in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, it, it starts in verse 3. It says, it is God's will. Whose will? God. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Now, pause real quick. For the Jesus people in the room, uh, I, I think you understand that there's a will that God has for your life, right? There's certain things that he wants you to do and certain things that he does not want you to do. He has a will for your life. But even if you're not a Christian in this room, you have to understand that God still has a will for you. He really does. And he wants to be able to speak that will into your life. But listen to what he says. He goes, this is God's will for you, that you would be sanctified. You know what the word sanctified means? We, we talked about it during our uh, Kingdom Culture series. But it literally means to be made different, to be set apart, to be different than this world. That's what it means. It says, it is God's will for you that you would be different than this world, that you should avoid going to Taco Bell and, and uh, being like, no. He says, there's one thing that you need to make sure that you avoid. One thing that could take you down and take you down really fast. It says that you should avoid sexual immorality. Come on. That each one of you should learn 
to control his own body. And, and oh, I, I can't, I'm just so full of these impulses. I, when there's a, like a chocolate chip cookie in front of me, it's like impossible to resist. Ridiculous. You are an adult. You are in charge of your body. Do you hear me? And he's not talking about chocolate chip cookies. Well, I couldn't. She was just so... Uh, uh. Learn to control your body in such a way that it is, what? Holy and honorable. Not filled with passionate lust like the pagans who do not even know God. Anybody in this room know God? Anybody? Come on, anybody? Then it says that it's different with you. Does anybody in this room want to create a life that is, that is good and holy and honorable before God? Anybody at all? Yeah. Then it says somehow you must be different than this world. Uh, he says you have to learn to be different, that you have to pursue something different. Uh, there is this theme. If you think of these three passages we just went through, um, there's this theme uh, that actively runs through them. There's this active theme that goes through these three passages. What's that theme? What did you pick up? I'll just tell you. Listen, that you have to be active. That's the theme. That's the active theme, that you have to be active in this, that you have to pursue this, that you have to run after this, that you have to be purposeful with this, learn, grow, pursue, run, avoid. That's all, these are all motion words, right? You're on a pilgrimage. You're on a journey through life. And he's saying you better be uh, smart in what you're, what you're pursuing. You better be wise in what you're pursuing because you will get caught up in this world. Anybody ever get caught up in the world? Come on, anybody? Come on, come on. He's saying you got to do something different. So you need and I need to decide to kill lust or lust will kill you. That's what he's saying. Um, feelings are real, but feelings are not reliable. You have to decide to pursue God with your life. Um, why is sexual sin such a big struggle? And why is it so doggone deadly? Let's talk about this. There's a whole bunch of reasons. But I just want to dial in to two, okay? Um, this is really important. I think the first reason that lust is such a big problem, lust is a problem because sexual desire is inside of us. Hear me on this. The problem is, is that sexual desire is in us. Like, listen, you don't have to, when you get out of bed in the morning, come on, look at me for a second, uh, desire is already in you. You, you don't have to go to some lust pusher and make some deal like, hey, I'll give you 20 bucks for that, right? You don't have to do that because you get up out of bed and lust is inside of you. Desire, sexual desire, it's already inside of you. Paul, the great apostle, he, he said this. He says that we have a flesh. We have two fleshes that we live in. We live in a natural and a spiritual world, right? They're together, but they're inside of you. They're both inside of you and they're warring. There's this flesh, there's this desire that wants to do whatever your impulses tell you to do, but there's, there's this other part of you that wants to honor God. He says we can live according to, to one or the other. We can live according to the flesh or we can live according to the Spirit of God. Listen, having sexual desires, you ready? Is a gift from God. Somebody, need, that's all I got out of the 11:30. The 9:30 was way more on top of that. Yeah. Having sexual desires is a gift from God. Amen. 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 Let me tell you something. Uh, he, God, loves sex. He loves it. He gave it to us. He created us that way. Uh, you know, when it came to making babies, he could have thought of a million different ways to make babies, but he picked a darn good way to make a baby, right? Um, but the problem is, is that like all gifts, like Adam and Eve, we pervert the gifts that are from God. Uh, we get consumed with having what God told us that we cannot have and should not have that will not be good for us. And this internal battle of the flesh, it's already inside of us. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jesus internalized this. I want you to listen to what Jesus says. This is amazing. Uh, in, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, he records Jesus saying this. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, he says, uh, you, this is Jesus now. He says, you have heard uh, that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Anybody ever hear that, that before? You've heard this, right? The idea is very simple. If you're committed to somebody, they should be committed to you, amen? Right, that's mutual, right? Uh, None of us would think it's a great idea to go out and have affairs. It ruins people's lives, right? It really can. Okay, and so Jesus says, this is what you know in his common sense. But he, he does something here uh, that's 
a little bit weird to me. I mean, he just ratchets it up to a whole new level. Like Jesus is, does this kind of stuff, and it's just crazy. He just goes, yeah, that's that, but I got something different for you. You hear what he says? Listen to what he says. Listen to this. He goes, but I tell you something different. I tell you that if anybody looks at a woman lustfully, he has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, let me ask you a question. Would my wife, Lynette, rather have me look lustfully at a woman or to commit adultery with that woman? What would she rather have? I think look lustfully, right? But, but Jesus is saying something to us. He's saying one leads to the other. Jesus is saying it's an issue of the what? Come on, it starts here, it starts here. Before it works out in the hands, give me, give me, give me, give me. Right? He, he says, it begins here. It begins with what you feed your soul. It, be, it begins with what you feed in, in your heart. And Jesus is so serious about this. He says something that is literally crazy. This is Jesus. And I just said Jesus said something crazy. That doesn't sound too good. Uh, but li- this is just nuts to me. Listen, uh, he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, he says, with this issue of lust being so important, he says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, he says, gouge it out and throw it away. What? (laughs) Gouge it out and throw it away. This is crazy. Uh, And and he says, why? He goes, it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And then he says this. So if your right hand causes you to stumble, he says, go ahead and cut it off and throw it away away for it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to slip into the pit of hell now here's a question do you think that jesus really wants a bunch of cyclopses running around do do you think that jesus his intent was for uh for you and i to gouge out parts of our bodies no he gave you two eyes he gave you two hands He, he wants you to use them But what he's saying is that there is this connection between the eyes and what comes out of your body. He's saying this is such a serious issue. This is such a destructive issue in your life. If you're not careful, you will ruin yourself and you will find yourself slipping into the very pit of hell. Let me tell you something. If anybody in this room has ever struggled, and I know there is, with sexual sin, you feel like you've already slipped into the pit of hell. And Jesus is saying if you're not careful, If you're not careful, if you don't figure out how to rein this in, you will be separated from God for all of eternity because nothing will take you further faster from the heart of God than sexual sin. And so why do we struggle with this so much? I think there's a couple big reasons, but the first is that it's inside of us, right? That God puts desires in us, but we are fallen creatures that uh, we have this nature and we take it, uh, what was meant for good, the sexual drive, and we bend it toward that which is bad. We have proclivities towards sin and pleasure and we so easily settle for the moment, don't we? Come on, don't we? We so easily settle. We, We know that a minute on the lips is a lifetime on the hips right? Come on. But we settle. But we settle. Uh, we're, we so easily give in to feelings, but if we act on those feelings, it will cause so much damage. And this is why Jesus tells us that we need to fight this and to fight this big time. Because it is in you. And it has the potential to wreck you. And here's the second reason uh, I think is uh, pretty obvious. Uh, lust is a big problem because we feed it. You hear me? We, we feed it. We feed it, we feed it, we feed it because we look at porn. Uh, We look at half-naked ladies in the gym. We look at half-naked men and women on on billboards, you know, constantly. We we read things in magazines that take our hearts in different directions. We, uh, We watch Netflix and all these movies that we know are filled with sexual things that could, that that will take our heart away from the heart of God. And we just think it's normal. We just think it's okay. I remember in our church years ago, uh, there was this guy who w- was struggling with, with sexual sin in a very big way. And uh, we were talking and he tries to defend his addiction to pornography uh, by saying, he said this, he goes, porn is really just an, a form of art. I'm like, come again? And uh, he's like, yeah, it's a form of art. He goes, it's just like acting, like any Hollywood movie. It's just acting. It's just an art form. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing. I'm like, go try telling that to my wife. Yeah, go try telling that to anybody's wife, right? Because instead of turning away from it, 
we feed it. Uh, then what starts small grows and grows and grows. And every time we feed it, uh, it, it grows bigger. And eventually it grows into an addiction or a way of life or something that we just think is okay uh, or, or normal. Uh, there, even scientifically, uh, this is, is incredible stuff going on. Scientists have begun to map the brain. Have you seen any of this? This is amazing stuff that's going on. Um, they're finding that our brains are literally, uh, literally have the ability to be rewired, right? Uh, it's like, um, if we feed them a certain thing enough, if they get a certain enough information, enough stimuli in one direction, your brain begins to reform around that stimuli. It's called neuroplasticity. Have you heard of this yet? It's an amazing thing what's going on. Uh, literally, uh, they, they say that your brain uh, can be rewired. It can be changed. Uh, it's malleable, that it's like plastic. One uh, scientist said it like this, that, quote, uh, just as plastic is changeable, we can literally reshape your brain. The way that you think, it can be rewired. Uh, true, right? Because what, sometimes what you thought was wrong so many years ago, now you just think is okay. Am I right? Come on. Uh, your brain is constantly changing and molding itself, right? Uh, you're, you're, you're building new neurological pathways and connections. And, and the reason your brain does this is so that you can perform the task quicker and easier. Uh, your brain can literally change itself. Uh, one scientist said this, quote, you can, uh, you can have a different brain today than you did yesterday. Isn't that crazy? It's true though, right? Uh, one scholar said this, that we train our brains uh, and whatever area we train our brain in, that area of our brain grows. Uh, so for example, he used, he says like math, like if you dial into mathematics and you like just really uh, put them in front of you constantly, work on them, work on them, work on them, train yourself in them. He says, you will inevitably get better at math. Now a little side note, that didn't work out so well for me in high school back in calculus. I'll just tell you that right now. Uh, but you get the idea, right? It's like musicians. If somebody has an inkling for music and you sit down and at first you're like, going, eh, not so good. But if you keep plugging away at it, your brain starts to think like a musician. You start to feel the rhythm in your mind. You start to feel the progressions in your mind, right? And it becomes natural uh, uh, to be part of who you are. It grows and grows. And what the scientists are telling us is this. This is amazing to me. Uh, that your brain... The more you feed it a certain thing, it will demand more of that certain thing. The more that you feed an area of your mind, it will demand more of whatever you're feeding it. Sounds a little bit like an addiction, doesn't it? Doesn't it? And this is exactly what pornography does. This is what sexual imagery does. It creates a demand for more of it, so much so that you will never able, be able to look at a woman or a man the same way ever again. You'll never know what it's really like to have a real relationship with somebody else. It will so rewire your brain. Now listen, we live in a culture that is absolutely defined by lust. Uh, everywhere you go, every commercial, every advertisement, every billboard, uh, you scroll on your Facebook feed, uh, your Instagram feed, it's bodies, it's sexuality, it's half-naked people. Uh, constantly, you, you go to uh, news sites, right? I'm a news junkie. I go to Fox News, CNN, and all that. And my wife will go, oh, why do those info babes have to wear so little clothing and, and, and you know why, right? Why? Because sex, sells. come on, say it, sex sells. sells. It's money, right? It's, it's clickbait, right? It, uh, they're, they're constantly vying for your attention and this is why people uh, struggle so deeply with sexual sin. It's because it is everywhere and we feed it to ourselves constantly. Uh, we have to recognize just how much we are feeding this animal inside of us. Uh, I remember years ago, I read the book called uh, Every Man's Battle. Every Man's Battle. Great book. You should read it. You should read it. Men, you should read this book. It's about the struggle uh, for purity. It's about sexual sin. Uh, so good. Every Man's Battle. And I, and I remember uh, the writer, he begins the book, if I remember correctly, uh, where he says he went out and bought a Mercedes. He saved up, found some success, Saved up all his money, went out and bought a very expensive Mercedes. He said he was so excited about this Mercedes, and he's driving it through his neighborhood one day, and uh, it was like right after he bought it, like day two or day three after he bought it. It's been a while since I read the book, but he, he's driving down the road, and he says there's this young 20-year-old uh, good-looking lady jogging on the, side of, on the sidewalk, and he's driving down the road real quick, and he sees her kind of coming up, and he's looking, and he, he begins to describe it this way in the book. He says, she's all sweaty. That's what he says. He says, she's all sweaty. And she's wearing, you know, those jogging outfits and it's all curvy and 
all that stuff. And then he says, then he says, things are bouncing everywhere. And so he's like, so he says he looks over and he's looking at her and not, not that you guys would ever do this, you know, but he's, he says, I, I'm beginning to crane my neck as I, I get past her and I'm watching and I'm craning and I'm watching and I'm craning and I'm watching right until I run into the telephone pole. And then he says, I have to go home and explain to my wife how I just ran my brand new Mercedes into a telephone pole doing 20 miles an hour. And then he says this, listen, quote. He goes, from that moment on, quote, I realized I had a problem. I realized I had a problem. And some of you are way beyond that problem. Some of you are a lot farther than that. And it's time that you realize you have a problem. Ladies in the room, um, I can tell you this. Uh, this may not be every man's battle, but this is darn close to every man's battle. Men, amen? Come on, is it real? Uh, and ladies, I'm not a lady. I'll never be a lady. Uh, I don't play a lady on television. But I'm gonna tell you something. My guess is, is that this is a whole bunch of your battles as well. That this is a human battle. Uh, and this is why Jesus elevated the stakes so high. Because he knew there was a fine line between fantasy and becoming a reality. And he says, we got to figure this out. Um, we got to learn to fight this. Uh, this. This culture we live in, it is trying to mess you up. Um, I, I just want to share some, uh, I did some statistical work. I tried to figure out what's really going on in culture a little bit. Um, I want to tell you what's going on in the world of pornography right now because I think it's the big, uh, devil's biggest playground. And it is ruining people. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you how much it is ruining families and ruining men especially, but women as well. Uh, li listen to this. Uh, did the research. Google reports that, uh, that every second, every second, $3,000 is spent on the internet alone in pornography. Every second, every day, every week, every month, every year, 365 days a year. Uh, listen to this. Google reports that uh, over 30% of all traffic on the internet is pornography. 30%. Think about all that goes on in our world, the government stuff, the financial stuff, all the school stuff. 30% of everything that traffics on the internet is pornography. Uh, pornography consumption went up 24% during uh, the lockdowns. And we thought people were at home fixing the closets and playing with their kids, right? Apparently not. Uh, more than 50% of people uh, engaged in online pornographic viewing um, say that they have lost sexual attraction to their spouse. And I believe that's true. I sit with people all the time who tell me that. All the time. Uh, porn sites just blew me away. Blew me away. Uh, porn sites receive more regular traffic than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined each month. Holy Toledo, right? 90% of teenagers, 96% of young adults are either encouraging, accepting, or neutral when they talk about pornography to their friends. In other words, people just have come to accept it. They just come to say, no, it's, it's okay. It's, it's part of life. It's just who we are. Well, I don't think it's good. And I don't think it's part of life. I don't think it should be part of life. I think we need to fight this with everything that we have. Anybody with me? Um, 64% uh, of young people, I'm talking about high schoolers, uh, say that they seek out pornography weekly uh, and they all admit to hiding it from their parents. Duh. Right? Uh, what's amazing is that 64% of every poll I found said somewhere around the 60 to 70 range. Uh, I'm guessing a whole bunch more lying. Right? And yet I talk to parents who say, not my kid. I'm like, what world are you living in? Uh, not my husband. My husband, he's fine. He's a good man. Well, he might be a good man, but good men are weak as well. Am I right? Am I right? We got to get serious about this. 51% uh, of male students, 32% of female students said that they uh, first viewed pornography before they were 13 years old. The average age was 11 and a half. 11 and a half. 64% uh, of Christian men who attend church say that they viewed pornography on a monthly level. On a monthly level, at least. 
Uh, here's a random fact. I thought it was interesting. Uh, the favorite, according to Google, uh, the favorite time for viewing pornography is 11 p.m. on Sunday nights. <laughs> Apparently, church wasn't that good. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe there's a psychology with anxiety, uh, going back to work for the week, the stress. I don't know what's going on. But that's what Google tells us is, is the case. Uh, listen to this. One of the top ranked porn sites in the world is actually listed as one of the top 10 internet sites on the planet with over 42 billion visits a year. 42 billion. Uh, it, it, its industry reports the IRS uh, online pornography reports $12 billion a year in revenue and over 370 million listed pornography sites on the internet. I think pornography is easier to get than fast food these days, right? And the entire world is telling you it's okay. The entire world is telling you it's fine, it's healthy, it's normal, it's helpful. But I'm telling you, it is not. It is not good, it is not fine, and it is not helpful to our lives. It is dangerous and destructive. That is why Jesus said that we need to figure out how to gouge this out of our lives. Amen? Paul, the great apostle, he says, flee, run from sexual immorality because nothing else will take you further, farther from the uh, heart of God than sexual sin. Nothing. He says, run from it. Uh, Jesus said it like this. He says, uh, blessed are the pure of heart for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. But there's nothing in this world that wants you to be pure. There's nothing, in, you hear me in the back? There's nothing in this world. There's nothing in this world that wants your heart to be right before God. Nothing. But you want to see God, don't you? I do. And he says it takes a pure heart uh, to get there. And so I was thinking about this. I think the only way to fight this. I think about this. The only way to defeat this in our life is that we have to exchange one great love for a greater love. You hear me? We have to exchange one appetite for a different kind of appetite that will truly satisfy us. Uh, we have to stop feeding one thing and feed something else. I talk to people all the time who say, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to defeat this. I have tried a million different things. I'll tell you what the answer is. Something must become bigger and better in your life than sexual desire. Listen, you hear me? Something has to become different in your mind. You have to exchange one thing in your mind for something else in your mind. You have to fill your soul with the things of God more than you fill your soul with the things of this world. And when we do that, things will start to change. Listen, Jesus said this. This is crazy one time. I think it's John chapter 6. He says, um, he says, in this world, look at me, look at me, look at me. He says, this world is corruptible. Anybody remember this? He says that you eat corruptible food and it corrupts your soul. You think he was talking about food? No, he wasn't. He says you can eat a corruptible food and you can become incorruptible. Uh, but, but there's a different kind of food. He says a food that is incorruptible. And then he begins to talk about this water that he gives. That's living water that will satisfy you when nothing else satisfies you. You think he's talking about water? No. He's talking about something different. Then he says something crazy. He says this. He says, so here's the answer to something better in your life. He says, I want you to taste and see that the Lord is good. I want you to taste and see that the Lord is good. And do you think Jesus wanted us to like take a bite of his finger or something like that? No. He's saying, once you get a hold of me, once you put me deep in your soul, once I become the object of your greatest affection, things are going to change. You're going to see that this is good. And that's destructive. So listen, friends, listen to me. Absolutely, absolutely, you should get accountability in your life. Absolutely, you should do things to protect your family. Women, look at me for a second. You should protect your husbands and your, and your children and your home. You should be the responsible gatekeeper. You should have filters on every single electronic device. Well, I'm an adult man. He can't do, she can't do, I'm an adult. I can do what I want. No, I want to please God and I know that I can be weak. And so I hand my phone to my wife and I hand my computer to my wife and I say, filter it all. You're in charge. Because in moments of weakness, we can all fail. Am I right? 
We have to be man enough to do the right thing. So absolutely, you should put filters. Absolutely, you should get accountability. Absolutely, you should educate yourself. Maybe you should get counseling. Maybe you should call church office for help. Maybe you should get something going on in your life. Maybe, this is crazy, maybe you should get rid of Netflix and HBO. Oh my gosh, I'm leaving this church. You're getting personal now. Maybe you shouldn't have the internet at all. How would I live? Old people in the room, do you remember a day we didn't have a phone to carry around and we still made it? I have no idea how we made it, but we made it, right? So maybe we should take this Jesus approach of gouging a few things out. But that's not enough. You can gouge this eye out and this eye out and cut this hand off and cut this hand off. It's not enough. Because Jesus said it's a heart, come on, it's a heart issue. It starts here, it starts here, it starts here. He says you got to fill your heart with something different. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And when you do that, when you pursue God like that, he promises to come and fill you up in a different sort of a way. See, we either kill lust or lust will kill you. That's all I got for you. That's everything. Let's pray. So Father in heaven, um, we ask for more of you, God. There is so little in our world that is pure and holy and good and beautiful. But God, at least some of us, we want that. All of us need it, but we want it. So God, would you, would you speak to us today? Um, for our friends online, would you, would you speak to them today as well? My friends, with, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want you to think about this. I want you to hear this from me. Some people in this room are feeling a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. But let me tell you, there is no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus. He wants to free you. He wants to free you. He wants something better for you, something good for you. So maybe right now you just need to ask him again, maybe for the thousandth time, to forgive you and to restore you and to cleanse you and to give you a new start, a new day. Ask him for grace. Ask him for grace not only to forgive, but grace to make you strong to move forward in your life. God, would you give us grace? Grace to forgive, but also grace to make us strong. Grace to know you and to follow and to love you. God, we literally invite more of you into our lives. Speak to us, God, for your child is listening. Amen. 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 Uh, big stuff. It's real. Um, it's real. I, I hope that uh, when you leave here that you will talk about this with your family, with your whoever you're accountable with, uh, your, your husband, your wife, your children. This is real stuff. Real stuff. Um, if you want to pray with somebody up to my left, uh, to your right, I know like when we talk about a topic like this, people go, I'm not going there for prayer. You know, but listen, I don't know what you want to pray about. I have no idea. But all I know is that if God convicts you and says, I should go praying, if you leave here and go to lunch without going to pray, then you've disobeyed God. And if you disobeyed God here, how are you going to obey God out there? Come on. It's the most important thing we do. If you need to pray with somebody, that's what we're here for. Uh, up to my left, to your right. Uh, get on Facebook uh, and share this message. Uh, share it with your family. Share it with your friends. Be bold. This is, our world needs this kind of thought. Amen? Amen? Let's do something good together. I uh, hope you guys will invite somebody next week to church. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of good stuff coming up, a lot of big changes. Uh, stay in the loop. I love you guys. Thank you for listening. Uh, we went a little long. Go get your kids before they kill me. God bless you guys.